it is my fault. Um, oh, I'll just press the yes, we're recording. Okay, there are, I do have a wide range of, of projects. I'm not involved equally in all of them. So some of them I'm speaking on behalf of my co-authors tonight. Um, now, most of you will have some uh, grasp on how the convict system works. And I can see Mike Pearson's here. Uh, Mike, uh, again, one of our uh, foremost senior uh, researchers in this field, having navigated a lot of the world heritage listing. Um, I'm not going to talk about Jim Kerr's hierarchy other than this idea that, uh, you know, the convict system, if there was such thing as a system, and we would probably contend that there wasn't, there were a number of systems which came under a broad umbrella. It, it really was hinged on the idea of labour and industry. So uh, labour was the way that you progressed and in the eyes of authority that you reformed, became a useful member of society and your failure to undertake industry or undertake your labour in a way that was uh, appropriate or considered worthy, um, so you go back down the scale. I'm not going to get back to this uh, chart today, but uh, I'll also point out it only represents a very particular period in the convict system. I'm going to start this off by talking about the core landscapes of production and punishment project. And some of you will have seen some elements of this, but hopefully this is a slightly longer presentation. So we're going to be talking about the Tasman Peninsula and Port Arthur and this idea, and I use this term advisedly because it's problematic, that the Tasman Peninsula from 1833 to uh, the very late 1870s, 1877, was in effect an industrial gulag. It was a closed penal settlement, um, free people could not go on to it. And most people are not really aware that there were a fairly large number of convict stations at various times in its existence, but we'll get on to that. In particular, what we wanted to explore was this idea of convicts as workers. Now you'll all be aware that there are many, many variants on how you might want to talk about the convict system, how you portray it. And many of the people in this room have undertaken uh, very interesting convict projects uh, of their own. Mary you know, has had a, a very long interest, for instance, in um, urbanism and convicts and, and Parramatta in particular. So this idea that we want to talk about was convicts as an industrial force and the convict system as being best translated if you looked at it like an industrial system. How did this relate to the reform or punishment agendas? How did this connect to colonisation or invasion? Um, how did convicts proceed through these systems? Now, if you go to Port Arthur today, one of the things that strikes you very much is that convict industry is almost absent. You just don't see it with the most telling site, which we'll come back to later, being this lovely, well, what was formerly, thank you, Richard, a lovely green grassy area next to the penitentiary, which was where the workshops were, but no more. Oops, sorry. And the story that you get about convicts, depending on um, when you came through the school system, who you talked to was, it was all brutal labour, it was all about quarrying or making roads or cutting timber down. But when you look at the list of occupations uh, just for Port Arthur, what you see is this vast array of industries, trades, aptitudes, everything from that hard labour regime through manufacturing, through artisan craft. I mean, people were doing everything. These were some of the most complex industrial settings um, in the colonies. Uh, so, you know, it's not quite right to call them company towns, but they weren't far off. Now, just to explain some of the logic behind things is, of course, this project was also about this idea of synthesis, how we can um, make the parts come together. And many of you who've done consultancy will understand the, the horror of having to record yet another convict culvert and saying, what the hell does this mean? Well, by linking it through labour, it, it all starts to make sense. So I'm going to start with, with this, which is a pair of convict shoes. But of course, there's no such thing as just a pair of shoes. 
the first thing on a place like the Tasman Peninsula is there is a farm where they raise the cattle, which is run by convicts. Um, the co cows are then taken to the abattoir run by convicts, where you have convict slaughtermen, convict butchers. The hides are then taken to the tannery. There are the various steps in hide preparation um, and tanning. But at the same time, there's people who are taking the bones to the bone mill. Uh, there's people taking the meat to the kitchens. Uh, there's people who are out there collecting bark and quite possibly doing things like collecting the urine because urine is one of the ways that you can tan leather. It's only at that point that you've got the hides where you can start to do things like make shoes. So you've got shoemakers of various different stamps. You know, some people do the uppers, some people do the soles, some people do the inners, all those sorts of things. And then you get your shoe. So it's not just a series of related convict run trades, but each of these, of course, has a number of sites associated with it. I, at the last minute, thought, gosh, why don't I do a map? And then I thought, no, focus, we'll get to that. But it raises lots of questions if we take this industrial approach. So these are skilled crafts. Who are the master craftsmen? Because remember, this is a male only site. So I, I use craftsmen because this is a male site. Who are training the people? So convicts are not there forever. They're only there for the term of their sentence. And that could be a number of months. It could be a number of years. It's not every convict that goes to Port Arthur settlement. So what do you do? Do you wait until you've got a, a master cobbler turn up and then you start making shoes? Well, no, um, you, you need shoes for the system. So how are they gonna learn about that? Uh, it is possible they bring people in, but we don't necessarily have the evidence for that. So what happens if you've got a master craftsman, a master shipbuilder, a master this, a master that, when they go? Well, presumably while they're there, they're actually showing other people how to do it. But remember, this is all happening out of the confines of the guild system. So we're at a really interesting period where, yes, we've got industrialization, um, mechanization, all sorts of things. But, you know, artisan's craft is still very, very strong and it's still very much a guild thing. So in a sense, the convict system starts to create um, workers who are outside of the traditional training regimes. We also have um, from 1834, uh, 35, sorry, I should know this, Point Pure, which is the first British boys industrial reformatory formed on the point just off Port Arthur. And um, those boys are being trained in various ways for convict industry. And we'll, we'll get back to that. But we also have to say, Okay, so you've got all these convicts right through this system, you know, 165,000 people, men, women, children, who are being trained to undertake craft and labour, and then they're freed. And what happens to them? Does the trained convict settlement trained cobbler continue as a cobbler? Um, you know, and, and of course, the work of Grace and others talking about uh, convicts as being very aspirational. Well, this is part of it. They actually now have a set of skills that they didn't have when they entered the system. So landscapes of production and punishment, I won't go through all the things, but I'll give you the opportunity to have a look. Um, the, the title for us says something, it's very meaningful. It's all about these dualities. Uh, the convict system is very much like any government system that, um, yes, there's an ideology behind it, which is to do with reform, punishment and whatever, but it's a government enterprise. And what government enterprises like more than anything is that they pay for themselves or even better, they make a profit. So while there may be all this theory about, you know, uh, the prisoner must do this, this and this, um, they must be denied the, uh, you know, support from machinery or from animal labour. They must do it manually. At the same time, the, someone is saying, yeah, that, that, that you've got a point there, but we really need 3,000 shoes by next week. So if we deny them all these things, we're not going to get the shoes. Um, and, and we see this coming through in all sorts of ways and forms. So we're interested in not just industry, but the industrious nature of the convict experience. These relationships between um, the places they do things, what they do there, um, the technologies they're allowed to use, not allowed to use, the processes that, that they can and can't. Remembering again that many of these places are on a frontier and it's a very core periphery thing. Um, how they're organised and overseen, what the products of convict labour actually are in its many, many forms. 
what the experiences are of people at various stages as they progress up and down. Now, the Landscapes Project is also a fantastic opportunity for us to come out and play with others. And so it was designed very much as a multidisciplinary project and in part so that we sort of rejoined with the historians in their dialogue and their questions about the nature of um, convicts. But also, you know, sociologists, so working with people like Barry Godfrey at Liverpool, um, who runs the Digital Panopticon, um, and trying to think about appropriate outputs. Can we work with industry? Can, and when I say industry, I mean archaeological industry, but also site managers. Can we synthesise work? And on and on and on. And construct in such a way that we could incorporate other people, whether students or interested researchers. So overall, I know it. You're probably already thinking it. It was ridiculously ambitious and it just gets worse from here. But bear with me. So there's, there's two main themes that I'm going to talk about really today. And again, thanks very much to Richard, because I think he's the one who actually came up with these. The one is the idea that the Landscapes Project was in one part about the recreation of landscape and then about the repopulation of landscape. And this is also to do with the relationship between the archeological and the documentary resources. However, we're also really interested in this idea of flow that both the people within the system and the things they produce are products. And those products move around. So they go from site to site, um, but they also move through a system. So it's both conceptual and practical. And again, this idea that it's about labor, your performance of labor, your productivity, your achievement. You know, some convicts are valued more than other convicts because they have skills. Port Arthur is a fantastic place to try this out because it is so well documented. But of course, you know, I don't have to explain to you guys that documents don't mean truth and they don't mean they're complete. So for um, Port Arthur and the, and the recreation of landscape, we've got extraordinary amounts of material to draw on. And in the first instance, to start geo-referencing, to look for, you know, where sites are, how they evolved, how they're used, all those sorts of things. So digitization. Thank you to Richard for undertaking the incredibly painful task as part of his postdoc of pulling all this information together and getting it into the GIS so that we know what what not just buildings are, but even spaces within the buildings are at various times. If you want to think about it as workflow. Um, we've already gone through the first part of the historical documentary analysis. At the same time, that's both directing and is informed by the um, non-invasive remote sensing end of what we're doing. So we have picked up as one of our core project uh, methods using LIDAR wherever possible. Very good reasons for that. And I'll expand um, about the joys of stomping through the bush in Tasmania. Everything is compiled. Um, we then go through a process of ground truthing. When I say we, I mean Richard. Um, I, you know, <laughs> happy to leave that to him. But then we move on to interpretation and or analysis and interpretation. So we we have digitized forms of these landscapes and the features, which we're then able to interrogate in various ways. Now, again, I'm not going to get into a lot of the depth and detail of results. We've published an awful lot of papers. Um, if you really like, contact me and I can send them to you or send you a reading list. However, and here's the however part, all of you will be aware of Jim Kerr's seminal works uh, designed for convicts and later follow up by Out of Sight, Out of Mind. But Jim was an architectural historian he primarily relied on the documentary record to inform his ideas of the evolution of the convict system. But, you know, it, it was a grand work. There is so much that is still valid about it. And I'd be the first person to say, oh, you know, it's probably not to be uh, duplicated. But having said that, one of the long term outcomes of the Greater Landscapes Project is to see whether we can produce, in a sense, an updated version that is better informed by everybody's archaeological research. Now, why do I raise that? Because 
We're also dealing with this idea, I think first raised by Damaris uh, in the 1980s in response to uh, Judy and Dennis's Swiss Family Robinson model, that colonisation is very much also at the whim of remote administration. So if you think about it, oops, oh, sorry. I can't get the graphics to work. Ah, there we go. Um, You've got all sorts of wonderful bits of ideology being thought up in an armchair in England. They send instructions out to Australia. They can't implement it and don't understand what's needed. They send instruction, you know, questions back. And this is constant sort of, you know, year and a half before they can clarify things. The colonials are saying, what the hell? We can't do this. We don't have the resources. We don't, the landscape's wrong, all of those things. So we're dealing with, in a sense, compromises. So we're just going to use as a quick example the Cascade Probation Station, which is one of the sites on the Tasman Peninsula. All of these are lovely plans of what that station was meant to be. So the top one in 1840, you can see extraordinarily beautiful someone's drafting dream of a um, almost radial prison effect where um, everything's nicely balanced and you know first class here, second class here, everyone's separated, there's a chapel in the middle. Within a year or so, they send a revised plan in, you know, in 1841, which is sort of got the main principles about separation and classification, but is a bit like someone drew it with a crayon on a piece of paper. But 1843 is the first of the as-built plans or theoretically as-built plans, which looks nothing like any of them because what you don't see is where the station's meant to be has these huge ravines on either side. They cannot build these expansive pieces. They've got to be... <laughs> squished in. So they've got those elements, but they're now sort of stretched out across the landscape. But we're not still not 100% sure what actually was built, it, because they're on plans as parts of reports, and that does not necessarily indicate reality. So this is our guess of the probable final configuration of um, Cunha or Cascades, which again, you can just compare it to the thing on the, on the top left hand side. Um, not even a close relative, but it still embodies the principles that were um, required. So one of the elements in terms of the field work was going out to these sites um, and checking whether things were built or not. So for instance, this field, uh, so this property has been owned by the Clark family for about three, nearly four generations. Um, the paddock where the plans indicate there was a set of um, separate cells, in their memory, there's never been anything in there. So we went off with the resistance meter off we went and you can see the result at the bottom that we came up with a floor plan where you can actually see the cells like that, including a very early jail complex, which is later replaced by the now still standing complex. So at least we were able to sort of, you know, guarantee that, yeah, these were um, reasonable plans. We had to do it on other parts of the station as well. All right, the other part of the idea of the industrial system is that if you remember Dennis Gojak's uh, review of uh, convict archaeology, which is now, ooh, I think, nearly 20 years old, was that by and large, uh, you know, we have focused on the institutions. Part of the landscapes project is to look at the landscapes. So that the stations or depots or whatever else are really just one component of a much bigger landscape of industrial activity. You know, they are the accommodation service hub, but they are not the place where the convicts are. So Cunha, again, um, went through the process. It, you know, again, the Clark family have owned this and they know it like the back of their hand. And we have fair sense of what the history of the site is. Um, if you go out into that hinterland, uh, you know, do the oral history with the clerks, they'll tell you where there was logging, wasn't logging, what they know of, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of that is still quite heavily forested. It's very hard to get through. But if you run the LIDAR over, so, you know, shoots the lasers through the vegetation, you are able to strip the vegetation and you get a digital elevation model. From the digital elevation model, you can start to see what are clearly not natural features. You can see all those long um, anomalies there. 
which with interpretation, uh, ground truthing, whatever, they turn out to be convict era um, saw pits. Um, very interesting, you can see that they actually match the contour of slopes. So we think that's very much to do with how they're dropping the trees, or at least the largest of the trees, you know, probably digging the saw pit afterwards, because these are huge, <laughs> like these are really, really tall trees. But then there's log slides, tramways, um, sawmills, buildings which you've yet to identify to remove the timber from where it's logged and to increasingly convert it and eventually to take it out to the jetty, which is just off the side of Cunha. So we suddenly have this giant landscape of industrial activity. But even more so, we can start to do time and motion studies because we know who's working there or how they're meant to be working. Um, one of the points is that if the logging operations followed the rules as set out, almost no work would get done because a lot of these men are in irons and it would take them, you know, the better part of two hours to get to work, you know, from the station. They then got to do it, but the rules then say they have to go back to the station for lunch. If they did that, they would really only have several hours of work time a day. So something's clearly not quite right between the rules and the actualities. Um, you know, we can then look at uh, the processes of material coming down, how it goes out, and then where it, where it gets distributed to. Oops. But you can then go back to the core side of Port Arthur, which some of you will know very well, and you can start to interrogate them by asking really, really blatantly obvious questions like, where does all the building stone come from? So we've got 40 years worth of archeology. span And when, when we started, there were a number of thoughts about where the stone might've come from, but no one actually gone and done a study of that. So by talking to the grounds staff and some of them are again, second and possibly even third generation, they're all property owners. One of them said, oh yeah, I think I've got a quarry on my land, which is basically just over the fence from the world heritage boundary. Um, he was kind enough to let us go and have a look. And what do you know? He wasn't wrong. There's this great big quarry, 110 metres long, 15 metres deep, with the last of the blocks carved out, ready to go, but not broken up. So obviously someone just said, that's it, time out, we're, we're gone. This is not even the largest of the quarries. Uh, later after this, another person said, yeah, I think I've got one of those on my land too. And that's possibly twice the size. It is huge. Here's the LIDAR, which covers it. And here's some of the interpretations. So I'll just flip back because also in that landscape are um, lots of other convict era items, basically the transport system. So there's a major timber tramway that goes to the site. There's the quarry tramway that in this case, I think goes straight back to the separate prison. So that's presumably the project they're working on, they needed this for, there's the waste and so on. And I'll get back to the quarries in a second. But on the side, if we start to interrogate the stonework itself, what we can see, because we know when buildings were built, that in different time periods, the stone is being quarried in different ways with different levels of skill and different sizes. Why? because you've got this fluid workforce of people who know how to quarry. They're coming from different places with different experiences, with different types of stone on the basis of, well, you've quarried something, so that's close enough, we're gonna use you. And they just do what they're used to. So you can actually see this is very, very distinct clustering of um, how the stone is cut. And talking to some of the modern uh, masons who work around the site, um, they've got various opinions on, oh, they got this wrong, they cut across the grain. Why would you do that? Well, the answer is you're a convict and you don't really know what you're doing, but you're told to do it, so that's what you do. Moving even further afield, so there's all sorts of things you can do the same type of analysis on. So the bells, I am a little obsessed with the bells because they were cast at Port Arthur. Now, this is not something that you do just because you're, you know, you're vaguely interested. You need genuine skills. But the first thing we have to say was, where does the metal come from? Is it coming specially from England? Is this bell metal? Um, who is doing the casting? Is it a bell caster? We can't find a bell caster. 
but someone is clearly willing to give it a go and they've done it, they do a really good job. Um, we've tried several tests um, on these and the, the, we haven't quite got the results because one of the problems is that any testing has to be in situ and we can't drill holes and things and we can't send them to ANSO to be irradiated either. But one thing we can say immediately is that the bell metal mixture is wildly variable. So they're not all being done at once. And if you look at a lot of those, um, it, it actually comes out uh, much closer in some cases to being gun metal, which raises the question, are they using scrap metal, old guns? We don't know. We've still got to look into that. Um, we've had work also done on the bricks. So using FTIR, Fourier Transform in Infrared to do elemental analysis on these and the likely clay sources. So we can see bricks being made in different places at different times with different technologies because the firing temperatures are different. But even more interesting is that there are lots of bricks on that site, which clearly were not produced by the clay geology of the Port Arthur area. We've taken samples from around the peninsula, but not everywhere. But one of the things that did hit is the refit of the penitentiary from a mill into the penitentiary. A lot of those bricks are actually from the coal mines. So the coal mines by this point have been hand or about to be handed over to private enterprise and they have got in there and they're salvaging the bricks and reusing them on other convict sites. So we think the same thing's happening that they're actually bringing in bricks from abandoned convict sites as the probation system collapses and all those other sites are being shut down. So we're getting a sort of a network analysis. So we've gone from landscape, we're going to move down the scale to the idea of the micro geography. So the workspaces that people occupy, how they use them. Now these are the later workshops. Um, so there's a whole range of early workshops I'm not going to talk about. I'll just use these as an example for the moment. Oh, and just hopefully everyone's had a look at the range of things um, in there. However, these are the notations on a plan. Is this actually how the workshops are being used? Does that change over time? It is far less clear um, that, you know, we don't really know those things because they're just not documented in that, in that way. So when I think about microgeographies, I'm thinking about, well, this is a prison environment. How are they organising space? How are they being surveilled or managed? Um, what are the dynamics of working in those areas? Now, I've used these photos. It's a cheat. These are actually from St Helena Island in Queensland, but it is a near contemporary operation. Um, there's all sorts of things that we have to bear in mind that to undertake certain crafts, certain you know, industrial processes, you need a particular amount of space, you need a particular amount of equipment. Are they doing a production line type thing? Are they still training people or using them to do them as craftsmen? Um, I'll just point out that you know, we've got the boot makers and the tailors. One of the things is, of course, tailors don't sit at a desk. They sit on a bench with their legs crossed, which also leads to all sorts of health issues. So uh, Julie Harm, who's one of our students who's helping us, um, was also an occupational therapist. And she says, yeah, there's a whole range of conditions which tailors have, which are a product of how they have to sit for extended periods at these benches. So there's apparently some ligaments actually named after them. Um, so we need to think about that. How were those spaces being used in those workshops? At one point in the early 1850s, late 1940s, 50s, there's something like 65 shoemakers not, in, not including the boys from Point Pure, and 13 men doing shoe repair. If they're all in the same place, you're looking at between 70 and 80 people if they are all working at once. There is no space in the workshops, despite the fact they're meant to be in there, that could accommodate them. So clearly that's not where the shoemaking is happening all the time, despite the fact that the plans say that they are. Well, one of our attempts to answer this, of course, is Richard's second postdoctoral project, which is the uh, Port Arthur Workshops excavation. Um, and many of you are aware that just as he got started, I think it was three weeks into it, COVID hit and he had to let his five assistants go. 
because it was a government contract they had to be paid at. So Richard has pretty much done this excavation single-handedly with the occasional help from um, Port Arthur staff and occasionally from, um, very occasionally from Katie and I. So it's quite a stupendous piece of work. Um, uh, I won't speak about this. I think this is another uh, very different Asher talk, but I will point out that the uh, picture in the bottom right hand side, the post hole that were, or the hole that was started by Katie, but finished by me, um, turned out to have one of the things you dream of. It's got an anvil, a broken anvil in the bottom. We think it might've been a casting pit, but we're still doing the analyses. So let's move on to this idea of repopulation of landscape. So, um, you know, archaeology has its limitations. We all know that. I don't have to convince you. But we have a lot of documents. But what is the relationship between the archaeological research, the historical research, in a way that makes them the same thing? So from the documents, we can extract things to do with space and place and activity and agency and on and on and on. One of the advantages we've got in, New, in um, Tasmania, which we don't have in New South Wales, but we do have in Western Australia, is that they use unique identifier numbers. So everyone had a police number and that went on every record that related to that individual. So we can actually track these people through a whole series of record sets, even if they change their names, even if they get married and so on. Um, so starting from the indents, the indents give you this amazing array of information about the individual. It gives you their physical characteristics, their biometrics, you know, their eye colour, their skin complexion, whether they got tattoos, whether there's evidence of pathology or trauma, um, their height, their weight, uh, where they come from. Um, it, it gives you the sense of, you know, where the trial was, what they were convicted of, what their skills might be, and on and on and on. But it's also these records have locations all through them. So the one that we've worked with, I suppose, the most for the Landscapes Project is the Tasmanian conduct records. New South Wales does not have its conduct records anymore. This is one of the record sets which probably got destroyed, although there is a hanging question about whether they ever existed. And I know Carol Liston's in the room and Carol's got thoughts about this as well. Um, so this is the record where they basically mapped your advancement back forwards um, through the system. It gave all of the indent data, but it also said what offences you'd conducted and potentially where you'd conducted them. So I just, you know, one example there that you can see. But we've got to get that out on mass because every conduct record contains, you know, possibly dozens of such incidents for an individual. And this is the point where we turn to citizen science. So we've been um, working with a big array of our students, but also volunteers from around the world um, to help us do this transcription. Um, they're fantastic. Some people are amazingly engaged. We've had situations where we put this material onto the web through Digivol and by the morning, um, a whole chunk of it's just been done by someone in America that we have no idea who they are, but they're interested in convicts. Um, it, it, it's a really good thing and we, we you know, work with volunteers to try and give them feedback as well. But you can get a sense of the richness of the data. I'll just zoom in. Uh, this is just one chap and in a very short period of time, he runs away uh, from Port Arthur, gets brought back, gets 50 lashes. By the next day, he receives a pair of stolen boots, uh, which either means that his have been swapped over or someone's, or he's nicked someone else's, which is very common. He gets nine months in the jail gang. Um, by the end of the year, another 25 lashes. Some of these guys just really don't know when to stop, but this is all agency. So these, this is in some respects, the voice of the convicts themselves. Um, you know, if you want to say resisting the system or how they deal with the system, so this again, the workflow for the digitization process from document to transcription, but then courtesy of the GIS, uh, we can put these offenses into space. Not every offense, um, you can see the stats there that uh, 1,589 individuals, their conduct records have been transcribed. We've got 589 Port Arthur offenses. Um, we can't locate all of those, but we've got at least 422 geolocatable offences for 194 of them. We don't have to get everyone. We just are trying to get a sense of how these places work. 
where do offences happen and why? And you'll see the number one place is they happen in the barracks, not in the workshops. That's really interesting because I suppose in the workshops, you're busy and you're being surveilled. In the barracks, you're locked in with 20 other men for eight, nine hours and you're bored. So, but moving back to the records, it gives us other opportunities. So we're, we're here with the stonework again and the quarry. We know what the task work rates are. So we can do a volumetric analysis using the LIDAR as to how much stone has been removed because we also we can see the waste heaps and we can match that up against the task work um, rates to see, well, actually how much labor does this represent? How many man hours, person hours, person days does this actually connect to? And I will say we could potentially do it with the buildings, but remember stone is going into the roads, it's going into the walls, it's going into the landfill, so that you know we're not going to get the, um, the complete set. We also have, because we are interested in industry, there are industrial stats for the convict system absolutely everywhere. And most of these have not been pulled together uh, in any particular systematic way. So starting with Port Arthur, we've pulled together those stats. We're still going through them. This is one of the things that a lot of the students are working on. So we can see the inputs. We can see you know, what is being harvested out of timber. We know what the settlement is using and we know what's being exported into the wider system, which also brings to mind you know, the same things probably happening with bricks and stone. So the FTIR and PXRF characterization gives us a signature for later finding where those Port Arthur products might have gone to. I've already mentioned that it's not just recidivist males who are at Port Arthur. In fact, the very earliest part of the area's history from 1830 to the start of 33, it's a timber camp. And during that period, a number of boys who are considered to be a useless portion of the convict population because they're too young and they're not strong enough to do labor, they are sent to learn how to cut timber. When it turns into a prison in 33, um, they are very rapidly taken out and put onto Point Pure. Now, this is a Katie's PhD project. I'm not gonna go into any detail, but again, it uses this workflow of documentation, GIS, um, condensing things, working out the landscape zones, but in Katie's case, she's also trying to work out what a juvenile landscape looks like. Are things scaled differently, presented differently? What labor tasks do they do? How are they being trained? To what sort of outcomes? Um, LIDAR, again, a, a site which was uh, farmed in various ways after the event. So a lot of work from Katie has been picking out what the convict era material was. Um, Again, see the labor landscape going through there. There's things which clearly were nothing to do with the, uh, the later farmer. They still remain unexplained. Labor distribution within the workshops. Again, we've got the stats, so we can actually put these things into, into place. A huge amount of work gone to that. We know the routines. We also have the conduct records, so we know what types of offenses are, um, are can, being committed by boys. And, you know, it's a lot of things you imagine, but there's also, you know, running away and hiding or being found in areas they're not meant to be, which could just be they're playing games. So impact and engagement is really important these days. This is the way that we uh, justify grants. It's not just to produce academic papers, to, but to produce outputs that people can access. Um, that's something that we should all aspire to and something which, unfortunately, we've not been really good at. So there are many, many academic papers. Uh, one of the, I don't know if people are aware of, we did a special issue of the Journal of Colonial History. And one of the features of this was a lot of the students we had at the time did papers. So uh, a bit of a shout out, I think Sarah White's in the room and probably Nina and Katie as well and Julie Butler, hopefully. Our other main output was the web map process. So this is readily accessible on the web. All you have to do is type in convict landscapes and this will come up as a link. Now you can see here, it's the GIS has been fully mounted. Um, you can interrogate that with the time slider, but um, you can turn features on and off. 
you can identify what structures are and spaces are within you know it gives you all the information from the gis itself so this has been worked out with you know both our team and the web designers at uh, esc i'll um zoom up you can also do the overlays of historic maps and plans now remember anyone can do this you can get onto this if you want the data behind it you can go to une and you can download the whole um, data set if you want to interrogate that as long as you you know acknowledge us um, but the other really nifty thing is that you can also interrogate for the offense data so for each year you can see where offenses occurred or if you've got someone in particular that you're searching for you can type their name in and you can see if they appear as having conducted a defense um, at any point so i'll just shut up for a second and uh, um, let you see what's happening it's also a great relationship with tahoe tasmanian archives because this geolocates a whole series of their plans so they're able to hyperlink people using the library resources back to the web map so they can say oh well that's exactly where that building is and and so on okay so i've talked a little about this whole idea that we're interrogating the context and the nature of common experiences uh, i talked before about uh, jim kerr's work but as we've mentioned um, most of you will have found convict sites which were nothing like anything in Jim's work because that's not what was built. Or they are called a stockade, but a stockade may start out as being one thing, it then transforms into something else, and then by the end it, it almost becomes a generic term for any sort of convict accommodation. So we're sort of moving our scale out from looking at Port Arthur, looking at the wider landscape and undertaking a couple of really basic things like trying to synthesize everyone's work to just figure out where the convict places are, what do they look like, how long are they there, and what role did they play in the colonization process. Um, so we've already got part one mounted on the web map, which is the Van Diemen's Land web map. Uh, Richard's put this together showing where um the convict sites are again time slider so you can interrogate sites at different periods uh you can interrogate different types of sites um i'll just scoot forward you can turn the roads on and off so we you know we have the roads and public works on a time slider we're adding stuff all the time so it's not it's not necessarily complete you can drill right in down to um townscape level and look at the movement of convict places within Launceston, Hobart, towns, whatever else. So we've got that going and in about a month's time we're going to see version one of the rest of Australia and Norfolk Island. Um, which is probably a little bit ridiculously ambitious again, but we've got 900 convict places, which include not just convict administration, but places of administration and control like military, police, courthouses. We haven't started on the public works because I only have so many hours in the day. Um, but that's the first run of where the dots are. Um, it'll have all of those features. We've got uh historic maps and plans that you can turn on and off as overlays taken from various archives so you can actually look at the system as it expands but then it contracts hopefully eventually you'll also be able to look at things like public works where they are and where they are not because of course then as now it was an intensely political thing what we also want to do and it's not going to be as easy as for tasmania is we're going to try to link people to places so i've talked a lot about the archaeology backing this up are, are other team members people like dave roberts hamish maxwell stewart who are working with uh history students on even more transcription programs uh for instance uh we've got uh, uh conviction politics in tasmania which is looking at absconding we're doing the same thing in new south wales we've done the 1830s uh, we're starting on the 1810s and 20s um, if you look at uh, the absconding notices that are published in the papers or the government gazette, it not only tells you who's absconded, all those physical details about them, which often reflect the indent records, but it tells you where they absconded from. Now, there's some things we can't say 
pinpoint where they came from, but quite a few of them we actually can. So um, we're also doing a toponym project because there's a lot of place names that just aren't used anymore, but they are on generally on older maps. Now, just a quick aside, I love absconding data because um, what we're also doing is looking at it on mass. And what we're finding is that a lot of these offenses and abscondings, uh, they're not individuals, they're groups. So we're interested in stressor points such as what is the lunar cycle? What time of the year do people abscond more during winter or spring when there's more or less work from what types of sites, what areas at what times? Is it something to do with the overseers and on and on and on? So there's all sorts of factors that you can bring into it. And again, fantastic biometrics. Uh, we had a little run with some of the students to do with the tattoos. Um, I won't go through all of them, but I want to point out, why would you possibly have a tattoo of your landlady on your arm? But there you go. Women, a far smaller range of tattoos. Again, don't have time to go into it. Now, just to tail off towards the end, some of the other things that we've got going, some of the current student projects, we've got Julie Harm working on mapping Macquarie. And this is trying to actually find out where Macquarie went on his various tours around the colony. I mean, precisely where he went, because I would like to investigate whether the people he meets, the places he goes, then influences where he does and doesn't put the public works. You, many of you will understand what happens is that Commissioner Big is sent over on the basis of trouble being stirred up by the MacArthur's and others that Macquarie's misusing um, the convicts and public monies to do public works in the wrong place. So how do we map his tours against where all of these public works from the Macquarie era actually turn up? Even more complicated is Mark McLean is looking at the evidence from the big report using big data analytical approaches and machine learning to try to figure out the nature of how Macquarie really is deploying labour and convicts around the landscape and whether he is or isn't favouring certain groups, certain areas, certain professions. But also looking at the Brisbane period afterwards to see whether Brisbane just draws a line and cuts it off or actually goes on and um, does something, you know, uh, which leverages it. Another project which we're just spinning up is the other Sydney. So when I say spinning up, we've actually been doing it for quite a while, but because I got sick, we, we had to put it down for a bit. Um, Kingston in Norfolk Island was originally called Sydney. And I'm interested in the idea that Norfolk Island and those colonies, so it's in Arthur Phillips' original um, orders that he is to colonise both Botany Bay and Norfolk Island, you've got this whole other version of the Australian colonisation process going on. And it's not the same. You've got villages with convicts and free workers. And I think it's what there are various attempts to do in Australia, but it just doesn't quite work out. But even more importantly, what we've got now is comparative assemblages. All of the work that's been done in Parramatta and Sydney, we have got absolutely contemporary um, archaeological materials, which we can compare to material that was excavated by um, people like Rob Varman or recovered from the Sydney, um, I mean, the um, Sirius. And I'm interested in environmental change. So we've gone to the first stage. Dave Roberts has been uh, getting his students to help with more transcriptions. We've transcribed a lot of the early land records, indents, or things which more or less are indents, victualling lists. And um, Katie has been working with us to get the first level of GIS together to actually attach people and property to places. And very interesting stuff's coming out. But again, I'll leave another talk to do with who is given land where, proximal to land fertility, proximal to administrative centres, proximal to water sources, and so on. And so this is giving us a chance to actually look at also the transition from convict into emancipus and therefore theoretically free settler. Environmental change is a big thing that is now emerging for all of our projects because the convicts are a formidable force for cutting things down, uh, filling things up, um, changing the environment to what we see today. So we're talking about Norfolk Island. We haven't got time to talk about the cedar cutters up and down every single river in um, coastal New South Wales. Um, but they're there in the 1820s and they're moving vast quantities of timber out. 
Uh, an example is in 1904, Governor King has to pass um, a law that you can't cut any more timber on certain river systems because the erosion is already too bad. You can't get boats up them anymore. So it started really early. Now, finally, um, just a project which has spun off and just to show it's not all about convicts. Um, this is work that uh, Richard particularly is doing with Hamish Maxwell Stewart, putting death in its place. So trying to put mortality and health records into space using the 1840 Sprint plan. So that's the connection with the convicts because we were doing as part of that. Um, so by putting these 70 odd plans together, uh, geo-referencing them all to the modern cadaster, looking at residential occupation, uh, densities, looking at the types of buildings. So, you know, Sprint is in, uh, recording all of these things. We're then able to test all these assumptions about the spread of um, infection. What are the vectors? Is it actually to do with the rivulets being used as sewers, um, runoff, and just for the very last thing, you know, height data from the historical records, border health records. <coughs> We're then able to heat map. When I say we, I mean Richard, um, given where these um, diseases, infections, all those sorts of things are actually happening on that landscape. Okay, I think that is more than enough. Um, sometimes I feel that is way too much, but in some respects, we've only just begun. So I'm going to leave it there. Sorry for going on a bit long. Um, any questions? If people have got questions, can they put them in the chat, please? Um, while we're waiting for some questions, Martin, um, there are many, many things I could ask and comment. But just um, with your mention of Brisbane and what he's doing, it's been with our work at the F Parramatta Female Factory, one of our things has been to work out when the penitentiary is built. And there, and so Carol and I and Rianne have, you know, sort of come to some conclusions. And what is quite clear is that Brisbane and and the historical evidence is a little bit um, missing, which is the common story at the Parramatta Female Factory. So when I look at the stuff you have in Tasmania, it's uh, really quite insane in, in comparison to when we're dealing with the, the female factory. And but Brisbane was with the adding of the penitentiary to the female factory, Brisbane was implementing Biggs instructions, but you'd actually mm. think Darling had done it and, and Drew mm. was the engineer. That's the sort of, and that's one of the things we've been able to prove is that things are being paid. There's letters in the, in, um, the Sydney Gazette about payments being made during um, yes. Brisbane's work. So we're, we feel quite comfortable that this is being done by Brisbane, but the evidence, you know, it's a it's, there's like three or four things that make this very clear. And, and it's really all these peripheral things in the Sydney Gazette or someone's, you know, gone to, been gone to the penitentiary or, you know, the third class. So he's implementing the additional class that um, Big is recommending in his inquiry. So there are clear quite links. And I haven't always seen that on other, you know, other places that, you know, people are trying to implement Big's, um, mm. the instructions of, of Big. So I think you know, unlike the current government, perhaps I should say, who doesn't want to implement their instructions on uh, Royal Commissions. So I think there is something um, really interesting there, but it takes a lot of teasing out sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. And look, I, I think what underlies all of this is that um, we now have a lot of data. A lot of us have done a lot of work we're at the point where we really, as a profession, should start to synthesise. Now, I know that is not necessarily something that is within the capability of a, a commercial consultancy, unless you've got very particular interests. And I mean, I feel a certain onus um, that creating a framework that people can add to, contest, whatever, is a really important thing that we need to do. So, you know, um, students are there, they want to get into the detail, this is their one opportunity, and it's questions like the ones that you've raised, you know, when did this happen, under whose watch, um, you know, this is a really good chance to actually, you know, nail this stuff down. Yeah, yeah. look, um, I, I just think it's maybe a little bit harder than people are thinking, but I think there are a lot of things to be able to pull together. I just think some of the Sydney stuff is just really, really missing. Um, question from Kimberly Connors, I think it is. 
Um, are you working with Port Arthur or other sites to integrate your findings into their interpretation? At the moment, archaeological interpretations are particularly thin. Um, will there be new displays or training for tour guides? Well, that's a question. I mean, Port Arthur's, uh, this, that was the intention. And that was one of the reasons why it was the original landscapes project was very, very archly industry linked because um, so much of that and the industrial nature was missing. And as you saw, um, a lot of those sites just are not extant buildings. Um, but at the same time, Port Arthur, since we started the project has got a new CEO, um, its whole hierarchy has rolled over. It's got new interps people. And um, we've essentially provided them with the materials now and said, look, you know, this is great value. Now, Rich is just um, completing the workshops excavation. He's got to go back and do a couple of very small things that will be interpreted um, in part because they're also looking for opportunities to get people back to the site to see things new or to change the the emphasis in the interpretation away from the usual stories and the only way they're going to be able to do that is to engage with the archaeology so whether it's interpretation as archaeology i can't say all we can do is poke poke nudge nudge and uh pray that archaeologists get employed to help with that mm. process so yeah, yeah. um Thank you, Martin. Um, a, a question slash comment from Kate Clark. Again, not a question, but a comment. Brilliant talk, and I love the industrialization concept. I'm embarrassed to only just have discovered Eric Williams' capitalism and slavery that grounds the Industrial Revolution in slavery, which really resonated with some of your thinking about seeing the convict system through the economic capitalist rather than moral lens. Yeah, thanks very much, Kate, and lovely to hear from you. I haven't seen you for years. Um, uh, one other thing which I, I didn't mention is that we are reading quite a lot of the American literature. One of the ideas that we're playing with too is, you know, how do you turn, how do you see convicts as a capitalist tool? Um, that whether or not the urban landscapes that are established in Australia at this time, um, how we understand them as um, yeah, in the same way that uh, slave cities in the US are set up. So in the US, they've shown that a lot of the slave cities, that, that if you look at where the barracks are, where the military are, where the churches are, where the fences are, where the gates are, where the watch houses are, the whole thing is set up to keep that side of the population under control and managed and pliable. And, you know, not, it, not just for overt, everyone's going to write, but just to control movement. And they call these like the, the monuments of tension. So can we actually reread Parramatta or Hobart or even Sydney as a, lands a set of landscapes which are in part designed to keep the convicts under control, productive, but also with that weirdness that the person who's a convict this week is then the free settler next week. And he's also the person who's inviting the convicts to go down the pub with them, which is why they're absconding. You know, it's a very difficult way to work out how this all happens, but it happens. So, mm. Okay. Thank you. I think there's something we, um, we'll talk about offline there that I've spent too much time thinking about. A uh, question from Melissa Madden. Um, hi, Martin. Thank you. Fantastic presentation. I'm currently doing my PhD in timber getters specifically identity, stereotype and landscape. Regarding the timber camp prior to 33, do you see, I assume 1833, do you see a clear transition in the landscape between the timber camp and timber harvesting getting before and then after when the convicts were undertaking this later? So, you know, is there a transition when the convicts are doing it? Or is this only in the historical records? Ah, well, that's, that's, that's really interesting and a hard one. So from 30 to 33, they are convict timber getters but they are um, convict mechanics and Richard will probably have to sort of <laughs> clarify all this. Um, they're, they're not recidivists, they're, they're higher level uh, mechanics working for so the engineering department, which I, I can't remember. In 33, um, they're still there, but they then bring in the prisoners and the, there's a lot of tension because the mechanics are saying, hang on, uh, we're not prisoners, we're, you know, we're much higher up the food chain, but we're being treated really badly. 
whether we see them moved out and whether we see an actual shift in the timber getting, I don't know, but I'd suspect so because the first bunch of guys, they don't need to be surveilled. They are experts. The second bunch, they are prisoners and they don't want to be there. So yeah, it's probably, and, and there's also other controls going in, like the they're not allowed to use animal labor to, to cart timber and so on. So yeah, almost certainly there's going to be changes. Whether we can pick it up in the archaeology, hard to say. We can certainly see the evolution, um, but it's pretty damned hard going out there. So um, yeah, great question. Can't quite answer it, but stuff that we are looking for. Um, just a, a comment by Belzo or Belzon, I don't know. Um, this the, It was work done by engineers and architects in yep. um, 1979, 80 on sources of clay and stone in the Port Arthur, Port, Port Arthur buildings, which you may not have seen. It was commissioned and reported on by yeah. Crawford, Cripps and Wegman and is probably in the uh, Port Arthur archives. Are you aware of that? Yeah. Yeah, thanks very much for that. Yeah, we actually, we we dug out all the old PACP files because we were very conscious we didn't want to reinvent the wheel or if the work had been done, we wanted to, uh, you know, reconsider it. So some of the Bell analysis was done because back in the 80s, they were allowed to drill holes in the Bell uh, Bells. We're not now. Uh, it turns out that that uh, clay analysis was, was really to do with the salt content. Um, in it, but um, which again was very useful for us because it says something about, you know, there are clearly batches of bricks that they were mixing with salt water, which is a huge no no if you know anything about bricks. So, again, this does feed into the where is the skill set coming from? But yeah, thanks very much. Um, a, a question from Amanda, who sounds like she's a student in um, Westbury in Northern Tassie. Um, she's uh, still working through a lot of documentation and data. There is certainly information about the location of the early convict area, quarry, military buildings, and later the probation stations. How easy is it to access technology such as LIDAR to investigate further? Um, well, yeah, look, um, I think Richard sort of probably jumped in and answered that a little bit. Look, every one of these stations had an industrial hinterland. All of them had the types of things that we saw in Cascades in one way or another. Um, so what we're hoping is over time, if we can sort of get this idea of the industrial hinterland versus the node, which is the station into people's heads, that you know others will start to draw things together. I, I didn't mention this, there's other projects that we've been doing. So Crystal Phillips um, uh, did a run is looking at some aspects of uh, the evolution of Port Macquarie and its hinterland. Um, so yeah, look, um, I'm sorry, not sure who asked. It was Amanda, wasn't it? So Amanda, yeah, look, there's a project in that if you're interested in putting all those bits together. Um, um, I, Richard's got a comment, but I'm not certain what it relates to, so I'll leave it. Um, Mike Pearson has said, there's obviously been a huge amount of work done and a huge amount of data. But is there a process for focusing on key areas that pursue topics across this convict system, advance the historical understanding, but also the management and presentation of the convict sites? Yeah, look, this is um, this is the point where uh, you know, focus, Martin, focus. Um, it, it is, as we all know, great fun to collect data and put it all together and do those things, but we've got to come up with something in the end. Um, we're sort of in a slight bind of that we are mid-flow in the transition. We, we, we're not splitting the projects, but Tasmania's doing what Tassie's doing, but we're setting up all those other projects around the place. Um, they're all going to have particular questions they're looking at to do with colonisation or environmental change or whatever. Um, I've got to admit, I, I don't have a clear idea, Mike, on how we're going to bring it back together. And... I would hate to do the God Professor thing that everyone assumes that I do have the secret somewhere. I'm just not telling them. I'm working it out as I go along. Um, but we absolutely, you know, we've dedicated this to, we've got to feed this back in somehow, um, you know, whether into higher or lower curriculum, uh, histories, whatever. So, yep, we're still working on that one. Uh, if, if you've got an idea, I'd love to hear it, but because that'd be great. 
Um, I'll just do two more comments, questions, and I think we'll leave it there. Um, Janine says, great talk, Martin, thank you. It really puts the Convict Data Project with Melissa in context. So I think she's been um, helping you out on that on that project by the sound of it. Yeah, Melissa's our, our volunteer coordinator, so I did, I, I think I put her in the acknowledgements, but um, thanks, Melissa. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, she'll be saying, where's dinner, though? Um, yeah. Dennis Gojak, um, after you reference him in his early paper on, on convicts, fantastic work, Martin and team. A question that talk prompts is whether the very different systems of control in Van Diemen's Land and New South Wales produced better emancipists, however, however you want to measure that in one corner or the other. Cheers. Well, wow, okay, so are we going back into the world of whether they take those skills and turn into good and productive colonists as they're meant to? Do we look at reoffending? Uh, do we look at their movement across the landscape? Um, yeah, we haven't quite got there, but that's the ultimate trajectory of this is do, you know, do we see as that life course progression in place, space, activity, whatever else, evolve into something because clearly it does evolve into something we're living in that something so you know how do we how do we see it how do we write it where does that system work and where does it fail um and, and this is one of the reasons that the uh project on probation particularly um where they pull people back in from assignment new south Wales just says nah had enough for that but in tassie and then effectively in wa they pull them back from the assignment system and say nah you're going to stay in government employee for a minimum amount of time to do the public works and get trained and then you can go off you know that's probably going to play a, a role in it as well but uh we'll tell you when we get there yeah i mean that's one of the big conundrums and it's certainly macquarie's conundrum you know he's been punished for doing public works um with convicts um, you know, the skilled convicts and everyone else is saying, well, they want the skilled convicts. So it, it's, mm. I think it's, you know, part of the, 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 um, you know, the balance in a convict society. And, you know, when governments change, so do orders change as well. But the ship takes, Absolutely. you know, six to eight months to tell you that the orders have changed. Yep. Uh, one, one last question, and that'll be it. I was particularly interested, it's from um, Susan Ashby. I was particularly mm -hmm. interested in the stats and the exploration of the operational aspects of trades and workshop activities. It makes sense to me that they would potentially have been swapping around, of, there would have been swapping around of tasks and workshops the convicts worked in according with, according to skill level, fitness, illness, weather, et cetera. There may um, have been a sh shift rotations to relieve uh, those working outdoors to do work indoors in winter, for example. So, which sort of fits yeah, in with your full moons and, yeah, look, absolutely. Um, right with you there, Susan. And that's what we think is happening is, you know, just because all these things are listed, and even if there is output, it doesn't mean they're all happening at the same time. So it could be the shoemakers workshop is the something else workshop next week, if there is a need from the system. Um, remember, you know, Port Arthur also picks up external contracts. So it provides the timber for the, the wharfage in Melbourne. Uh, you know, so it, it, so yeah, the, the system is paying for itself at various times. Whether we can pin it down to knowing that that really is happening, can't say. But clearly, there's seasonality, like brick making. You don't just pick up clay and make a brick. It requires a season for the the clay after it's been dug to mature. So we know those brick makers they've, they've got to be doing something else in that period whether they become the bricklayers because it's all bricks, whether they become the shoemakers, whether they become the labourers, we don't know. So this fluidity within the system is difficult. But this is one of the things that some of the history students have been working for. We've found a few of the task books for Port Arthur, uh, which show people moving from here to here and this job to that job, you know, but also the offence records. They're offending here, but then they're offending in some other trade and then they're ending up... so. Yeah, so again, this idea of the flow, people are moving, trades are moving, buildings are coming up and going down, it's all on. But, you know, we, we've got to crack how we actually work with this stuff. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, people with questions. Um, fabulous job, Martin. We really appreciate you kicking off this, this series. We're doing it bi-monthly, so 
Um, other things can happen in the other month, but um, uh, I, next one is Al Patterson talking about his ARC project in WA. Um, um, so I, th I think um, there's, um, you know, and um, I won't talk about the others. We, we have, we have um, Heather at Flinders will be giving a talk on the ARC project they're doing in, in um, where is it? Oh, Queensland, yes. And, and there's a couple of other ones there that we're just finalising at the moment. Uh, um, thanks, everyone. Have a great night. And Martin, I think um, Eleanor wants to have a quick talk to us.